Hi there, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. I do booktube stuff. I do actual plays of tabletop games. I do a whole bunch of different stuff. It's a very uh, eclectic channel, I think. Uh, today I'm going to do a July wrap-up, which is just uh, me going quickly over all 48 books that I read in July and giving a brief little rundown of the books that I read. Some I'll go into more so than others. A few I've already made videos on, so I'll just point to the video in that case and uh, I'll try to keep it going along since it's a lot of books. So first up, uh, to continue last uh, month, I have a Virginia uh, Wolf collection on Audible that I was listening to. I had read two, I think, in the previous month. And then this month I completed A Room of One's Own and The Waves that was inside uh, the same collection being read on Audible. Both were fantastic. I liked A Room of One's Own, I gave it four stars. And then I loved The Waves, which I gave five stars, which is a uh, autobiographical type stream of consciousness text in which um, there are five friends that recount certain parts of their life that revolve around a single friend of theirs that goes off to war and they're not sure if he's going to come back or not. And then the whole book sort of revolves around that. But each character is based on a person Virginia Woolf knew in her life, uh, apparently. And uh, so it sort of bleeds into situations of her own life and I, I just thought it was fantastic and as usual I loved her prose very much. Uh, I just get on with the everything that she writes so far so it'll be exciting to read more stuff like uh, Orlando I'd like to get into maybe next month. Then I read uh, Anna Karina and that was an audible book by um, Leo Tolstoy, but the person who narrated it was uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal, which was incredible. Fantastic book. I was very surprised at how accessible it was. I thought it would be very like dense and hard to get into because it's, it's a fairly weighty book. And I thought that maybe it would be, yeah, just, just dense in all the ways that some chonker books kind of are. But it, the plot is actually quite, almost deceptively quite simple. Every theme is broken down into different chapters. They all weave together perfectly. Uh, I probably don't need to talk about Anna Karenina very much because it's been talked to about to death, but I gave it five stars, so I liked it quite a lot. The next book is Zero Sum Game by S.L. Huang. I gave three stars. It is a interesting sci-fi book that was fantasy where basically she has a superpower that is mathematics which is kind of fun and so she's like a killer that can do impossible shots and all these other things like that but uh, all these other people that she competes with similarly have kind of powers but not really um, in different aspects and she's competing with them and then she gets embroiled in this conspiracy um, that was fine. I thought it did what it said it did on the tin. It fulfilled the genre promises. It was, uh, the prose were fine. The story was okay. It was a little bit melodramatic. The dialogue was a little bit cheesy, but it's kind of what you sign up for when you read the blurb. It's a, it's like watching a decent action flick. So three stars. Winter's Bone, I gave four stars. I made a video on that, so you can check that out. I think it's fantastic. Really good Southern Gothic, or Southern, depending on how you classify it, book about a girl who is put into an uh, impossible situation when her father uh, puts up their land for a, um, a bond to get out of jail and then may or may not show up for court so she has to go looking for him. There's a movie with Jennifer Lawrence, also very good, but the book has incredible prose, just incredible. You should check it out. Then I read Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by Malcolm Gladwell. 
I gave this two stars. I didn't like it very much. In this one, his arguments are very, um, just not very convincing. And they also like contravene his, his earlier thesis multiple times. It's a very weird book, I thought. And um, I'm coming to th see uh, Malcolm Gladwell as sort of like a, a magician in The Prestige where he's like doing a magic trick and you're not supposed to know that the bird that's being disappeared is being crushed by the cage and killed, but everybody sees the cage. It's a sloppy trick, or at least a lot of people. It's still a very popular book and he's a very popular writer, but I find very little of substance to connect with his writing. It's more an entertainment thing for me than anything substantive. So I think I probably won't continue with any of his other books. Then I read The Current by Tim Johnston. That's, I gave four stars and I made a video on it. It's a very good uh, mystery thriller, but in a literary fashion. So the pacing is slower. It's a lot more rich. It's a lot more dense to study on the uh, actual town instead of the um, just sort of sterile events. Like you're not only there to find out what uh, or who the killer is. It's more about how it affects the people even generationally and what it does to the town and what it does to a person and uh, trauma and things like that. So check out the video if you're interested. Then I read Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. I gave this four stars. This is a pretty big book right now. I probably don't need to say much about it because it's very popular. I think it's like a Reese pick or one of those picks, Jenna picks, Oprah picks, somebody picked it. <laughs> it's a uh, own voice immigrant story that is very uh, poetic. I read it on Audible though, so it was very different. Sometimes poetry, when read aloud, really sings and does it justice, but it depends on the narrator. And I think this one didn't quite connect. I've seen little bits of text for it somewhere, like excerpts, and it read quite well to me, but then when I heard it back, it was like discordant and a little bit weird. So uh, there was just a fundamental disconnect for it that kind of lacked the, the five-star judgment for me, but I still thought it was quite good. And I thought it was almost like in a conversation with uh, the Oprah pick last year, the um, uh, American Dirt one, which is not own voices. So it, w it felt like fairly in contrast to that one from what I know of it. Uh, I haven't actually read American Dirt, so that's just supposition, but that's what it seemed like. Uh, then I read Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Boulay, and I gave that four stars as well. That book I quite liked. It's a YA book on a indigenous uh, reserve where meth is being cooked and the FBI want to have a 17-year-old girl, the, char the main character in the book, to work with them to find out who is cooking the meth and unravel this conspiracy and stuff. And so um, it mostly does that plot justice, but it uses it as a springboard to talk about a lot of issues surrounding uh, reserves and uh, fundamental misconceptions of the public towards reserves, unpack racism, unpack sexism and definitely takes a look at how uh, outsiders trying to help the reserve often um, in meaningful and not usually intentional ways can damage aspects of it without um, knowing the real lasting impacts and I thought that was like the the real core strength of the book but then some weird things about it was the, it's a YA book, but she's supposed to be very precocious and intelligent and um, is like going to be taking a PhD course and all these other things. But she sounded like she was like 14 or 15. The voice sounded very like discordant from what you knew of the character basically, which is a problem I find in YA uh, quite often. It's 
it's still a character. You can make them intelligent and you can make them use diction that they otherwise wouldn't use in real life. It doesn't have to be, dialogue doesn't have to be perfectly realistic. And I think some writers grasp that and some don't. And this one doesn't. But it is still quite a good read and I recommend it. Then I read The Dream Life of Suanov by Olga Grushin. I made a video on that as well. I thought it was fantastic. I think it's being considered a modern classic either in English or in Russia and it makes sense to me. It's quite good. The pacing was a little bit off. Characters were fantastic. The prose were fantastic. The description, specificity, everything like that with the prose was fantastic and the meta-narrative and what the themes were trying to get across really worked for me. So next I read The Scout Mindset by Julia uh, Galef. I gave this four stars. This is all specifically about her own research in the scout mindset, which is opposing the soldier mindset, which most people have. Um, I don't know if I could talk about this intelligently, even though I read the book, but basically scouts are more um, interested in learning fundamental core concepts of how something works in order to understand it, grasp it, and then approach things with empathy, consideration, and um, soldiers are exactly what you might think. They're very aggressive. They want to understand the vulnerabilities of a system. They want to approach life and obstacles tactically. They're very uh, logical or prone to reasoning in a way that is not uh, conducive to what they're actually feeling. So it's like stoicism versus <laughs> Uh, a more modern thought process basically. I thought it was very good. I gave it four stars as well. Then I read The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk. This I read because it's a Canada Reads one and I think it's one of the last books I have that I need to read for Canada Reads. I'm not sure. There might be a couple more books I'm not sure but this one was pretty good. It's a fantasy book that is historical fiction and it's all about a woman who doesn't have any agency in her life. She's being married off to somebody uh, in this like magical land where um, men are the ones that can do magic, of course. Women are not supposed to and can be, there's, there's repercussions to it once they elucidate the magic system. But she, they approach a season in which everybody is to be married, which is probably based on like Victorian times, marriage stuff, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not familiar enough to, to say, but it seemed like it correlates to stuff like this. And uh, it's all about her trying to balance the needs of her family and her father's expectations with what she wants, what she, um, can expect and what she she sort of like has these hopes that don't jive of course with what her family obligations are and then she has to sort of strategically and tactically maneuver things in a way where she can try to make both people uh, both parties happy it was a it was fine most people like this book more than I did but Maybe it was just because I was coming off a whole bunch of great reads and it was just, uh, by contrast, just felt fine. It did what it said it was on the tin. That's why I gave it three stars. Uh, then I read Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. Um, I like Angie Thomas's writing quite a lot. This is a prequel to The Hate You Give. So it was kind of weird <laughs> in the sense that everything really meaningful about this book you may already know, at least um, structurally in the plot, um, because The Hate You Give goes into all the things that happened to this person in the past already. So if you haven't read The Hate You Give, I definitely recommend starting with Concrete Rose. It gives a lot more context to what was happening, but not, um, it doesn't expand things beyond what you, might be expecting and what you might be hoping which is what uh why i gave it four stars instead of five it was 
it still exceeded my expectations in the sense that it's sort of like a magical feat in that you know all the things that are, are going to be happening uh, plot beat wise. Uh, maybe not at a granular level, but you know the large strokes of this person's life already, basically. And yet uh, she humanizes the neighborhood and the characters so well that it's still eminently consumable, very interesting and compelling read, and it's quite quick as well. Then I read Just As I Am, a memoir by Cicely Tyson, who is a very famous actress who uh, basically pioneered uh, black people working in Hollywood. She was a huge rights activist. She was married to some heavy hitters, like um, she was married to Miles Davis. They were like a power couple. She has done so much work for the community. And the funny thing about it was that she, nobody knew how old she was really until like 10 or 20 years ago or something when she finally divulged it. Everybody thought she was much younger than she actually was. She died uh, in January of this year, I believe. Um, so this is her, this is very caught up on her life. It's pretty much everything that you need to know about her. She's a great writer. Uh, just the wildest stories that you could imagine. She's very thoughtful. She um, approaches her life in a no-nonsense kind of way. Although it has a heavy, heavy, heavy religious component to it, which comes across very strangely sometimes. But uh, that's who she was, and the book is representative of, the, of that, so you, I don't think you can fault it, really. It is pretty weird sometimes when she's talking about like having visions and angels calling to her and, and some other stuff like that, but people have spiritual experiences sometimes, you know? Who knows what's going on but uh, I gave this four stars I liked it quite a bit and recommend it I consumed it on audio the narrator was okay I would probably go with the book instead then I read Dominicana by Angie Cruz this was a pretty great book up until about the halfway point uh, this is about a 14 or 15 year old who uh, her parents essentially sell her to a man into uh, a marriage contact in order for them to survive. They're very uh, impoverished. They, they have basically no money. They are trying to develop a piece of land, I believe, and the only way they can sort of like seal this deal is if they married her daughter, or they married their daughter to this much older man who is uh, not a great person and mistreats her. He takes her to America and it's about her life adjusting to culture, um, the portrayal of abuse by this older man, both emotionally and physically, and sort of her own coming of age in this very like strange environment, which is pretty much just their apartment. Uh, she has few friends and she's trying to make sense of life uh, with very little information given to her. It's very vivid, it's very compelling work until she's stuck in the apartment and then the pacing slows way down. The prose become less evocative because there's just not that much description going on. There's not any action or movement. So it, it became a little bit like flaccid in the latter half and then ends with like a big boom when everything comes to a head. Um, I thought it was fine, I gave it three stars. Up until the halfway point, I probably would have given it four stars. Um, yeah, I thought it was okay. Then I read The Oxford Mur uh, Murders by Guillermo Martinez. I gave this three stars. I watched it just because I, or I read it because I watched the movie uh, to see how similar they are. They're pretty different, actually. The large strokes are the same, but things are very different. Like the Hollywoodization of this is almost comical where they try to make it like a lot more uh, sexy in the movie and the love interest is always padding around her flat naked and there's lots of sex scenes and nudity and all that kind of stuff the book is a lot more what you would expect from the genre 
but from a more literary bent. Um, but it's also like just fine. It, it felt um, it felt interesting when he was in his element talking about the mathematics and the the theory and um, everything to do with the plot that that was constructed. But the characters were just kind of felt a little bit thin. The interactions were fine. The dialogue was fine. So it ended up just being kind of a decent book, but um, nothing that blew me away, really. Then I read All's Well. I have a video coming on this. This is a Mona Awad's book that is coming in a week or so, July 6th, I think it's coming out, something like that, or this month at least, I believe. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I gave it four stars just because the beginning is a little bit brutal. It's about a woman named Miranda who is a former actress, a, st a stage actress, and she has chronic pain, is managing a department, a drama department at a school, and she wants to put in, put on All's Well That Ends Well. The students don't want to do it, and uh, it's about a strange circumstances happening to her where her uh, chronic illness and her pain is sort of flipped on its side and suddenly she has like a bunch of agency and can kind of control her pain and start mastering the elements of her life where she didn't have any agency by way of like a supernatural component basically. Uh, so if you've read Bunny by her, it's got a very similar sort of genre bending aspect to it. Similar prose that are amazing, in my opinion. And um, it was just fantastic. And you can watch my video soon on that, I believe. Then I read Inland by Thea Obret. I gave this four stars. I liked it quite a bit. It's a um, deconstruction of the Western with a heavy dose of like, I guess psych psychological thriller. It plays around with structure quite a bit. It moves in time, uh, even, I don't think it marked when it's going back and forth in time, so you had to kind of like figure it out. There is a uh, prose that kind of reminded me of Cormac McCarthy where there's um, no quotation marks and um, just like the paragraph structures and stuff like that was reminiscent of it. It was very interesting. Uh, the plot itself wasn't that satisfying, but the themage around it was very great. I thought it had a lot to say about the specific genre and it told a story to get you there, but you also felt as a reader that that's what it was doing. So it felt a little bit manufactured, if that makes sense. But it was still a fantastic read, four stars. Uh, then I read Leave the World Behind by Ruman, Ruman Alam, I believe. Hopefully I said that right. If not, apologies. I gave this three stars. Uh, this is a book that's been talked about a lot. I think it's probably another pick. Reese or Jenna or some Oprah or whatever. Somebody picked it. It uh, has been compared to like a get out um, dystopia type thing. So basically these this people rents a cabin, or not a cabin, but a, a very luxurious house in a place that they couldn't afford in kind of a, a, a timeshare basically I think is what it is. They're living luxury that they couldn't ever afford otherwise when a dystopic event that happens that is never codified in the text occurs and uh, the actual owners of the house, two black people, show up, a couple, a man and a woman, and it sort of like creates this friction and uses the fear of the unknown happening outside to highlight racial issues and um, inequality juxtapositions and basically all the, the ways in which white people are privileged are being confronted with the fact that a black couple are doing better off and processing a situation better and still having to like essentially carry these people over uh, 
the finish line basically of the of the story uh, because they're freaking out and don't have the tools to deal with things and it, it's just a, it's quite clever in that way but the plot and the pacing are pretty brutal I found it's very simplistic it's quite boring at some times when it's not making a specific point it felt like it should be a short story or the beginning of an like actual novella or a novel or something like that but it has been padded and fluffed out quite substantially is what it felt like to me i thought it was okay three stars then i read beach read by emily henry which is a uh, rom-com type of book where it's enemies to lovers these two people that ostensibly dislike each other are writing books and they decided to swap genres um, and in the process get to know each other. It's pretty charming, it's pretty funny sometimes, but there's aspects of it where it teases really interesting things like uh, they interview a person that's a part of a cult and there's like all these different B-plots that I, I guess work together to try to get them together in different situations but as soon as they're they become like any kind of item or they're in scenes together all of those b-plots kind of drop to the side and you you notice and <laughs> feel that lack uh especially because some of them are pretty interesting and then they're just gone they're never mentioned again it's a fine book if what you are specifically wanting is the romance and that trope just don't expect anything else because then you'll get let down. Uh, then I read A Separate Piece by John Knowles. I gave this four stars. This is a book that I had reread and had to read for um, high school. It was a mandatory book. And on the reread, I really liked the prose. I really liked um, the plot, which is a, a boy goes back to school to remember all these different things that happened to him. And it's about his little clique, where they're uh, together all of the time and fund a club where they're jumping off of a, uh, a tree branch over like a river all of the time. But when a boy that he doesn't like um, is going to jump off, there's some um, question as to whether he who was jealous of the boy perpetuated this accident that happens to the boy or not and it's all about like his exploration of grief and uh, accountability and his relationship with the boys and also coming of age in the time of war and um, also one of the original sort of like prep school settings for for boys in literature I think or at least maybe if not the original but uh, a very popularized version of it and I thought it was good I didn't like the things that it had to say about uh, masculinity and a whole bunch of other things but it did what it set out to do and it did it very well so uh, the fact that I disagree with what the author was trying to communicate about boyhood and nostalgia and things like that I didn't feel merited punishing in the review just because I would much rather a author try to communicate those things to me and I disagree with them and still reward the actual text with a positive review than sort of batting it down just because I didn't agree with the um, the stance that he had taken because at least it made me think about those things and analyze them and come to a conclusion about them myself. So not bad in my opinion. Uh, and then to contrast this, I read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith, which is a, another coming of age story that centers a uh, young woman who is impoverished, who is a first generation immigrant in Brooklyn. And it's about her life story, the agency that she gets, uh, while uh, having to deal with poverty and her her family situation like she has to drop out of school in order to 
take care of her parents and she needs to get married and it's just like a very it's a very vivid view of what uh, Brooklyn was like at the time I thought the description was fantastic the themes were fantastic the life story itself the plotting everything was used to maximum effort and effect I thought it was I thought it was really great uh, and it, frankly like I was saying it starkly contrasted the lack of uh, great theme work in a separate piece or not the lack of great theme work but it had better things to say about coming of age and healthier things to say and more impactful meaningful things to say about impoverty uh, impoverished people and their lack of options and choices in the world and how money is much more than what people realize if they've actually ever been in poverty before so it's also about privilege in that way too and it's just uh deserves to be the classic that it is, I think. Then I read Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I gave this 2.5 stars, rounded up to three. I thought it was okay. It's about uh, siblings who come together for a party uh, rager, like the, it's supposed to go down as like a, a most momentous night in Malibu history or something like that where Lots of movie stars and all that kind of stuff meet at this person's house, one of the children who's now grown up, uh, to... And then it just kind of tracks half of the book is the history of the, the children, so the father and the mother, their relationship, and then how they were born, and then what the relationship with their father was like, and then the latter half is after... Um, after all that takes place and just particularly at the party and what happens slightly after the party. Um, so this book was okay for me only because the first half is very padded and feels like it was <laughs> needed to bake some more. It's like the most cliched story of this Malibu uh, family ever basically. Like, it's very hard to empathize with them because they're, um, they're living a cliche. Like, you can, you can literally guess every single plot beat that's coming as soon as it happens. When, like, from the meeting of the parents, how their marriage happens, what happens during the marriage, the fallout of the marriage, like, all of that stuff. There's nothing, it's all well written but none of it feels truly novel or super compelling and then afterwards the whole party dynamics there's so many times that it jumps into people's heads that don't matter whatsoever about the party like it's just sort of interesting tidbits or something that happened at the party and it just reminded me how much i hate parties like that <laughs> to be honest like people are trash they're trashing your house People are hooking up, they're drinking a lot, it gets out of control. Yeah, I get it. But it, the party also works to um, come to a head with the siblings to confront their father about all these things that happened. And that was, to me, what the book was about. That's when it was great. That's why I rounded it up to three stars. That part was inf impactful. The only character that I cared about and wanted to follow was the person that got to confront the father. And when she did that, uh, that scene was just perfect for me. And then everything else was just sort of detritus and felt like, why wasn't this story just solely about this specific thing? But most people liked it much more than I did. So who knows? Check out other reviews. Maybe people have other... Um, perspectives on why it was good that I just kind of missed. Um, then I read Anyway the Wind Blows by Rainbow Rowell, the last book in the Simon Snow and Baz trilogy that used to be just a standalone. I actually gave this two stars. I didn't like it because their relationship, even on the third book, is just spinning wheels, spinning wheels. Yeah, they finally have a conversation about it and confront a few things, 
but they literally don't resolve anything. The plot uh, feels mirrored to the first book in a way that is not satisfying or in saying anything interesting about it to me. There's lots and lots of side tangents that it takes that have no bearing on the A plot whatsoever. There's just a bunch of B plots where I think she was just trying to tie up things that she had mentioned and really liked in the world, but it 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 didn't really matter to me. And why I was there is to learn about Simon and Baz. Anyway, I made a video on this, so if you want to know my full thoughts on it, including spoilers, then you can check that out. I'll link it below. Then I read Loveless by Alice Osman. I gave this five stars. I loved it. This is great uh, ace arrow romantic representation. It's about a girl who's just going into college and hasn't kissed anybody, is sort of like a borderline obsessed with romance but hasn't been in a relationship and hasn't crushed on anybody and hasn't been super interested in anybody. And when she moves into college, she starts to question aspects of herself and try to get at her sexual identity, basically. And along for the ride are her friends that are similarly going through coming of age type stories and sexuality awakenings. And uh, it's just very like respectfully done. It's wholesome in the way that Alice Osman always is. It's, uh, it's just, uh, representation executed in like the most perfect way as she always does and I, I loved it I gave it five stars I then read The Big Sleep the first book in the Philip Marlowe books by Raymond Chandler I gave this four stars um, it's very problematic in some ways mostly due to uh, when it was written I'm sure but still it's pretty weird sometimes it's a little bit uh, racist sometimes but it also wasn't as bad for me because I listened to the audiobook who is narrated by uh, Ross and um, Monica's father and friends I don't know the actor's name but you know that guy who's very wholesome Jack Geller <laughs> uh, it's that guy reading it and they they censor out like they bleep out um, swear words and uh, profanity and things like that but because there's some gaps in the sensory you, you can tell what the word probably was and what's going on but for whatever reason that did actually help me enjoy the story a lot more uh, I won't go too into it it's it's a very like quintessential maybe the quintessential noir tale where uh, a man gets hired by a uh, man who is missing a daughter both of whom are femme fatale type figures who try to seduce Philip Marlowe in some ways and try to like sway him to change the case to their own favor at different points as more things become apparent in the plot. Um, so it's fun, but it's sexist. Anyway, next book I read was Blade Runner 2019 Volume 3. Uh, home again, home again. I gave this three stars. It was a fine uh, conclusion to the arc of that comic book series. I won't go too in too much into it because it's three volumes and it's one continuous story. I thought it was fine. If you liked the first two, this will be a fine continuation, but the first volume is the strongest part of that arc and the other two I just gave three stars. Then I read uh, This Cruel Design the second in this Mortal Coil series by Emily Suvada. Uh, just like the Mortal Coil, I gave this four stars, uh, I believe. Anyway, I liked the first one quite a bit, so it was either four or five stars. This one I gave four stars. It continues a really interesting plot where uh, they're still trying to figure out the uh, inner workings of a virus. There's a whole bunch of... <laughs> basically all of which is spoilers for the first book where it continues a mysterious plot line about who the actual main character is, uh, what she did in the past, and they're recreating uh, or reverse engineering, trying to find out and suss out events of the past 
that will allow them to move forward in the future. Um, but it all comes spiraling into some sweet, sweet drama. And it's a, it's a YA sci-fi slash maybe like a little bit of fantasy, but the science fiction is apparently well researched and could actually happen. Everybody I've seen who's reviewed it said that it was very like uh, on point and surprisingly um, plausible, basically. So that's scary, but also pretty interesting. <laughs> I, I recommend reading on if you've read the This Mortal Coil, and I'm going to read the third book this month, hopefully. I next read The Other Black Girl by uh, Zakiya Delilah Harris. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I gave it three stars. This has been compared to uh, Get Out in an Office Space type environment. Weirdly, the blurbs on it say like that it's a lot more comedy and humor um and i didn't get that at all so i don't i don't know if i just have a weird sense of humor or that set my expectations for the book in a very different way than what it actually was um this is about a black girl the only black girl in an office until in a publication house, no doubt, um, that finally is like working her way up as an assistant and trying to get more uh, representation in the publishing house and work her way up to, an, uh, to a good position when a rival uh, comes in and establishes herself, another black girl who uh, is like ostensibly sucking up to her boss and starts like subverting her immediately and it's about like workplace dynamics of pl uh, privilege and white people and people of color uh, a lot of complex things are getting mapped out here i thought it was really good at that aspect and i really liked it when there was a twist and it started the get out horror type stuff but it also made it feel uh, very discordant because the blurbs I think had really set me up for something that was entirely different than what this novel was doing so my expectations were just completely mismatched I still ended up liking it and giving it three stars but I think had I heard that it was like a horror get out paired in an office setting I would have like been there with it a little bit more you know and like been ready for what was going on instead of you know expecting a a uh, whatever it is that I read <laughs> basically um it's still worth reading I think it's doing some really interesting with themes it's a very unique horror story uh, just like Get Out was yeah it was it was good so the hype is somewhat real about it just I would uh, I would align my expectations if you have plans to read it I then read The Invention of Morel by Adolfo Boyo Casares. I gave this five stars. This is a New York Review book classic, and it's a classic for a reason. This gave me very big Piranesi vibes. It's about a man who is marooned on an island, and there's all these like machinations and technologies that he doesn't really understand and are clearly having a big impact on the island. But he's trying to understand what that is so possibly he could get off it or at least understand what's happening and from time to time he'll see other people and they're interacting in ways that are like suspicious so he sends a he starts like stalking them basically to find out what the heck's going on with them and they'll like be there one moment and not the next and then when he finally tries to interact with them he can't or like they ignore him or something weird is going on but uh the main thrust of the story is the plot in which he is making sense of his world basically it's a very psychological novel it's very interesting and compelling and it goes through like almost different genres as he's figuring stuff out like it feels kind of like supernatural and then it feels like science fiction and then it like keeps changing and changing so it's very interesting it's only 100 pages I highly recommend it it's fantastic um, 
and like I said, if you're into Piranesi, this I would bet is got some fundamental pairing with that. Like Piranesi probably was influenced by it or something's going on because there's, there's very similar things going on. I read uh, Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. Most people like this more than I did. I gave it three stars. Um, this is historical fiction in which a woman is basically dying forever. <laughs> she lives a life, dies, and then is reborn into a new life and reborn. And so it's a meta narrative where you're trying to She's trying to figure out, and you are as a reader, how she's going to navigate these lives and what, um, like how she, like what the end game is basically for this, right? If she's constantly dying and reliving a life and sometimes re she's retaining some knowledge, sometimes it's just like intuition or, yeah, I guess it would be mostly intuition where She's died in one way and then sort of steers clear, but it's at an instinctual level. And so yeah, the, the, the pleasure of it is figuring out the end game, but I found it to be a little bit repetitive and uh, the setting and the dialogue and um, just the time period overall for the historical fiction just aren't super my thing. It's not what I would typically pick up, so it didn't really have like a huge chance of hitting four or five stars with me anyway, but uh, I think it succeeded and so I gave it three stars. It, I felt it was pretty good. I then read The Flat Share, which uh, is by Beth O'Leary. I rounded this up from a 4.5 to a 5, which most I, I don't think I've ever read a romance where I liked it this much ever. This is a book with some really interesting central themes that are worked in and like explored in a very respectful and interesting way, but in also like a no-nonsense way. It's about a woman who is in an abusive relationship who finally gets away from her abuser and goes into a flat share, which is the only thing that she can afford, uh, basically. So she's living with another guy but they never see each other. Their schedules are completely opposite. She, Her hours in which she's gonna be in there don't coincide with his, but they start a relationship of sorts by post-it notes, which is pretty cute, <laughs> uh, and an interesting way of them getting to know each other in this day and age. Like, they both have cell phones, obviously, but they could, and they could do that, but instead there's like this writing letters quality to it. And eventually they do meet, they do like try to, they have a unique relationship basically, whether it's friends or lovers, you'll find out, but just their, the, the seriousness, it approaches the goodness in people and them wanting to uh, do right with communication issues mixed into it and uh, trauma and the uh, life experiences one has that shapes how they react to certain situations is just top-notch with this book I think uh, and then it's exploring of abuse with while still being respectful is what really drove it home for me it's also just incredibly funny it's uh, steamy when it needs to be and yeah I just thought it was fantastic I was completely surprised so five stars I then read The Underground Railroad, which uh, is by Colson Whitehead, of course, but I, I gave this four stars and quite liked it, but um, I found that the show was actually better uh, than the book in some instances. I didn't realize that they were so similar but so different, and the show takes it in a much more science fiction way which is what I was expecting. And so when I read the book, I was a little bit let down because that component is actually not there very much. So yeah, it was just, it was interesting. But all of the central relationships and the impact, the most impactful dialogue are the same. So on the show and the book, 
they have the exact same language. Uh, it's like verbatim. Uh, so that aspect was really great, but the show does flesh out aspects of the book that I feel did need fleshing out, so it probably could have been a five-star read had I not seen the show first, which is a little bit unfortunate, but the way it is. Then I read The Sanatorium by Sarah Pierce. I made it 12% into this book and then gave it a one-star and DNF'd it. I just wasn't into it. It felt very trite. <laughs> it, you could tell where the mystery was going right away. I wasn't too into the sterile prose and it just the characters weren't that interesting. It was taking a long time to introduce all of the characters. Um, yeah, it just didn't hold my interest whatsoever. I then read The Book of Life, the third book in the All Souls trilogy by Deborah Harkness. I gave this two stars. Uh, I thought it was okay, but not great, obviously. It didn't give me any of the closure that I wanted from the other books, and it also felt very discordant with the first book, where um, the, the main character has more agency somehow, it feels like, than the third book, where suddenly she's got like all this fallout from the um, time traveling that didn't make any sense whatsoever. It felt very contrived, <laughs> uh, laughably so sometimes with Jack especially. There's v just, yeah, very weird stuff that happened with the time travel where she was just trying to make aspects of the second book relevant where it was fine. You could have just left it in the past and that would have been all right. The main villain in it I didn't find compelling or interesting. He felt like a very like gotcha bland stupid villain to me. The uh, magic system was further made uh, apparent and that was really cool. The world building aspects remain very interesting in this book but everything else uh, was just felt like padded fluff and and didn't feel like she kind of knew where she was going to be tying everything up and it just felt yeah ragtag and not that great to me. I then read Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Gyasi. I loved her home going so I gave this a try especially because it's a Booker Prize I think. Um, I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, I really like this book but Similarly, this was a book where she was a third year PhD student and very intelligent and uh, precocious. Uh, again, just like that other book I was talking about, um, The Firekeeper's Daughter. She sounded like she was 14 or 15 or 16. Again, like her emotional maturity wasn't there. Her diction wasn't there. It was very weird to read that story with that kind of prose, um, which I felt were like, the actual sentence by sentence and the paragraph structure were completely fine. I just didn't like the voice in particular for the book. I did like the plot and I did like how it um, went into addiction and what happened to her brother and her mother and societal issues and things like that. That was fantastic but the voice just really hampered it for me, so I gave it three stars instead of probably four. I read, I then read Mary Jane by Jessica Anya B-L-A-U, however you pronounce that. <laughs> I gave this four stars. This is a very smart coming of age story, I thought, where it's about a 14 year old, year old girl who in the summer takes a job as like a helper slash nanny for this uh, couple that starkly contrasted her own Republican family that are very stifling and conservative in every single way that you can imagine, especially the way that they treat her. Um, and she sort of comes into her own in a situation where she's learning all these new aspects about life, about liberalism, about the ethos of the 70s, especially is all packaged into this one family and her taking care of a child that is uh, very endearing uh, was just 
a fantastic read. I thought it clipped along, it conveyed everything about the spirit of what it was trying to communicate. The themes were great. It didn't have any of the um, BS that you expected for it to have in like the dad hitting on her as a nanny and all that shit. None of that trite stuff is in there at all. All of the drama comes from external factors that make sense. The characters are fantastic. The family that she lives with is uh, a therapist, which is only now being somewhat regarded as a real thing in the 70s, and a stay-at-home mother who are taking care of, in private, a um, famous rock star duo, uh, like a couple, like a, a man and a woman who are married, but have an open relationship. And so, yeah, she just has like all these vectors of thought that are opening up as she talks to and thinks about and has new experiences with all these people instead of being stifled at home. So it was just fantastic. Four stars. I then read The Roommate by Rosie Dedan. I gave this four stars. I also really liked it. Surprisingly, uh, I guess I, as long as there's some good themes going on and romance, apparently I like it. This is the most romance I've read in a month, for sure, hands down. But uh, the things that I liked about this book a lot was it plays into its cliches very well. It's about a um, very, like, well-to-do, uh, privileged girl who, on a whim, moves across country to New York because her crush it has a room available in the in this flat that he has. And as soon as she gets there... He is in a band, of course, and takes off because they have an opportunity and she's stuck with a room that the guy rents out without her knowing to a random person and the random person ends up being a porn star. <laughs> so it's a enemies to lovers trope, but it's a lot more wholesome and also a lot more steamy than you would expect. It's not... The masculinity of the porn star is surprising. It's like, it can be toxic at times as you would expect perhaps, but it's also uh, stemming from a place of vulnerability that makes sense. And once they like get to know each other, their dynamic is really great as you expect, probably because the guy's a porn star, the scenes are very steamy but it's actually super sex positive and framed in a woman's perspective. So that was pretty interesting. And then furthermore, it even springboarded into talking about uh, sex workers' rights and uh, pleasure professionals' rights, the industry and its toxic nature and how uh, sometimes porn can be a good thing if it's filmed and uh, written and conveyed in a more healthy way than what the porn industry is doing now. And um, that was just really interesting. I had no idea about that. And yeah, so the themes were just, again, super on point. The dialogue itself was pretty meh. The prose were okay. I read it to it um, on Audible. So <laughs> it was it was interesting to hear <laughs> sex scenes that vivid uh, in your ear when you're shopping for groceries, but uh, yeah, it was surprisingly well narrated, great story, no complaints, four stars, definitely exceeded my expectations. I then tried to read The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer that was going to be an audiobook as well because it was a chonky one, but uh, I couldn't do it. I made it... 20% in or so and it was just so dry and so uninteresting to me that I just ended up dropping it because uh, while the idea of a biography of cancer really appealed to me and what should have been interesting the way that it was written just didn't click for me whatsoever it was it was like reading like a academic textbook basically where he was just prattling on about all of his patients and I just, I couldn't handle it, so I moved on. I then read Chess Story by Stefan Zweig. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Z 
W E I G. Anyway, I gave this five stars. It's a classic book, another New York uh, review book classic, and it's very short again. It's like 90 pages or something. But it's about um, people who are on a cruise, I believe, or on a ship anyway, going somewhere. Uh, and they realize that a chess champion is in their midst, and it goes into the chess champion's backstory. And at first you're just like, okay, this is kind of interesting, but I don't need all this detail about this person. Then they get to the match where he's, um, I can't remember what it's called, doubles or whatever, but he's playing uh, multiple games at once and beating them all. And then suddenly a mysterious challenger uh, comes up and stalemates the chess champion. And the next day it's their um, chess battle that happens. But before that happens, the uh, main character who's writing this sort of in a, in a in a journal recounting these events he talks about uh, he talks to the person who's the mysterious challenger and it goes into his backstory and so it becomes a very psychological book that was super interesting and compelling where the um, psychology behind those two characters and how they played and what happened to them shaped the game that is played later on and what happens. It was just fantastic. I thought it was incredible. I'll definitely read more from that author and was very glad I read it. I then read Fight Night by Miriam Taos. This is a book that isn't out for a couple months, I think mid-September maybe. So I might do a video on it then. I gave it three stars. I thought it was okay. It's written from a child's perspective and that's just not my favorite. Uh, there's only so much you can write from a child's perspective until it starts getting kind of meh. And this got pretty meh pretty quickly for me, but it, to its credit, it did have some interesting themes. The plot was compelling and the dynamics between the little girl and her grandmother especially were super perfect, on point, great dialogue, uh, lots of interesting stuff and surprisingly funny. So I gave it three stars in the end. I then read Chapter House Dune, finally completing the uh, six books in the main two trilogies or whatever. I won't be reading more of them anyway, but um, this was fine for me. I really like the philosophy and the religious aspects and them breaking down. Um, just the, the general movements overall of humanity and what it means to be human and our faults and our strengths and inserting that into the plot that's compelling but the plot itself is pretty simplistic and some aspects are trite especially the sexism and so I'm just kind of relieved to be done with it but I thought it was fine yeah. if you take the series as a whole at a meta level I think it's fantastic like four or maybe even five stars but the plots themselves are fairly boring the things that it has to say and the themes and the way that it's executed are good though so it's contradictory. I really like the series as a whole but each individual book I feel struggles in some way. I then read A Town Called Solace by Mary Lawson. This is a um, Booker Prize a long list I believe. It's a Canadian book so I wanted to like it a lot more but um, this is a book about a little girl whose older sister goes missing and about a um, old woman across the street from her who is sent to um, basically like a, a medical retirement home sort of thing. Part of the plot is figuring out where she is and why she's there, so I won't give too much away, but anyway, she leaves her house and the tenant that moves in, a man, it is about his story and basically like all of these three perspectives bounce around in time to paint a picture of the town, what happens with the disappearance of the person and the innermost thoughts of uh, each individual basically. I thought it worked pretty well. I gave it three stars, it was okay. Um, I didn't get too much more out of it just because I've seen the same concept 
executed better in other books so I wasn't too impressed but I still thought it was a good read and it did what it said it was on the tin so I gave it three stars. The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. I gave three stars. I thought this did what it said it did on the tin very well in some cases but some stories are better than others and that contrast just like with all short story collections with me kind of brings it down. It has to be very exceptional for a through line of uh, short story collections to get above three stars for me just because invariably some of them I just don't really like that much and then there's some great ones sure but it just feels like if there's no really hard themes that connect them and there's like a lack of cohesion that it's just impossible for me to get on board with them above uh, the exceeds expectations of, of four stars for me and unfortunately this is a similar case for me. I really liked how it uh, goes into character work for a bunch of the different ladies and I liked that uh, it jumped around chronologically in order to um, go into self-referencing certain stories within a story. So somebody will say something, do you remember that time when? And then one of the stories will be that time or around that time. And so that was fairly interesting, but yeah, just some sto stories were more interesting than others, so. I next read College of Shadows, a Cambridge Gothic book by Mark Wells. It's an audiobook that I got. I gave it two stars. I didn't like it that much, but I did like the themes. I did like the um, the Cambridge aspect. It's pretty cool. Basically, it, people compare it to Harry Potter, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. It's three students that go to college, and eventually they are attacked at night by like a winged beast essentially and they try to figure out what it is and all these other mysterious things are happening around uh, the college as well and so some some of that stuff is interesting but the actual character work feels a little bit flat the prose are like very noticeable because they're read aloud and they're kind of boring it felt very much like commercial fiction and then I just didn't really like the ending so it was not that great, but maybe if you're quite into the aspects of the story and you don't mind the prose, I think it would be an easy three. I then tried to read The Emperor's Blades, which is read by, or by Brian Staveley. And it is on audio, but it doesn't say who the narrator is. Weird. I DNF'd it at 29%. This is dark fantasy in which all the tropes of dark fantasy that I hate are present. <laughs> it's basically like the author took the opportunity to label it dark fantasy because he wanted all of the shitty things that happened to especially women to be featured in the book and then probably that is what will make it realistic fiction. It's also like... <laughs> a mix of two things that I also really don't like, military fiction and specifically war fiction, mixed in with that. So everything about the book I didn't like and the the plot is the emperor is killed and his children are survived but assassins are after them. So it sounds like it could be cool but mostly they're just in war camps being trained, trying to fight off these assassins while their co-workers are sometimes being raped and pits and uh or otherwise sexually assaulted or murdered usually the women all of the women so i just wasn't into it i then read the sense of an ending by julian barnes this is a book that i gave four stars it's a classic i think most people are aware of it i thought it was really interesting because it goes into memory. This is a story about a man who is in his 50s who's recounting events in his past as best as he can recall. So it's all flavored by his motivated thinking and it's specifically about how his memories have changed from what he thought they were 
to what they actually are um, because he meets an old acquaintance of his and some of the thoughts and feelings and um, just memories that he has are way different than what he thought and that forces him to confront who he is, who he thought he was, his actions at the time, who he is now. It was, it was pretty interesting. I liked it quite a bit. Um, I gave it four stars and I recommend it. And then the last book I read is Carthage, a novel. I'm cheating a little bit here because uh, I finished it actually this morning after midnight, but I'm still gonna count it anyway. And this is Joyce Carol Oates. This is about a town who similarly has a girl disappearance happening. Uh, so the setup isn't all that unique, but what is unique about it is that um, basically she, the author goes into great detail about the event itself and then also the psychology of the family members and then from that psychology of each of those people it springboards into the wider world and into systemic issues in America itself and Western culture from that launching pad. So it's very interesting because it is a disappearance and it is a mystery and you do get that answered but the main sort of thrust of the novel and the things that it is exploring is much more about human nature, uh, how we treat each other, why we hurt, why we hurt each other, what communication is like in how we are socialized, uh, what war does to people, what trauma does to people and how trauma begets more trauma, especially when people who are traumatized inflict more trauma on other people. It's about how family holds the, like the key to your heart. Basically, they can they can very easily lift you up or break you down. And in some ways, they don't know that they are doing that as they are doing it. There's some throwaway lines by the father who is addressing the daughters, uh, like about who which of them are his favorite girls and how he like sees both of them. That is just like super shitty and chilling, and he's. He's just clearly so privileged that he doesn't understand or ever reckon with what he's said to them or how it could factor into the decisions and like what happens in the future. It's, it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways, but it's also a very humanizing perspective. You don't get to have anybody singled out and um, pointed out as the bad guy. Everyone's bad and everybody's good and it's more interested in looking at systemic issues and I thought that was fantastic. So if you can't tell, I gave it five stars. <laughs> I love the book. It was my first Joyce Carol Oates book. I'm definitely going to be reading more of hers. I couldn't tell you why I picked this book up uh, out of all the others. I have Black Water. I have We Are the Mulvaney's. I have like three or four other books and I'm, I just randomly picked up this one for some reason. So who knows? Anyway, that's 49 books instead of 48 because I cheated with Carthage and um, that'll do it. Hopefully I kept this pretty succinct. Feel free to comment. Let me know what you're reading, what you're looking forward to reading. And based on the books that I liked, feel free to give me recommendations. I'm going through a lot of books a month. I could always use more stuff to read. And hopefully I'll see you next video. See ya.